Thank you very much, Pastor Joe. And um, I've been speaking here for several years now, so I brought this to fly swatter. I'm going to use it. Because every year there's a conference fly that keeps coming. And no one ever kills it, it's always there. So this time I am prepared. This uh, afternoon I'm going to. Uh, attempt to tackle a subject which is very a subject that's so important to the Christian faith. Now, of course, the sola is it's in, it's impossible to exhaustively teach on any of the solas, you know, under an hour. But I'm going to present some basics because I think it's very important for the church. It's very important for the church in their personal lives and in their proclamation. And the sola that I uh, am so privileged to present to you is solas Christos, Christ alone. Amen. One thing I want to say in the, in the forefront, the solas were not invented by the reformers. Amen. And as we'll see, I'm going to make that point even stronger, but the solas, or sole, the five of them, were reactionary. They were reactionary to the false teachings of Rome. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, If I'm seeking the favor of men, I'm not a bondservant to Christ. They were not seeking the favor of men. But as a bondservant of Christ, you will defend the gospel till you die. That's what we do as bondservants. We defend the all of Scripture. And I would mention we have the five sole, but also there's something called tota scriptura, which was a concept that taught all of Scripture should be proclaimed. Not bits and pieces of it, but all of it. And unfortunately, too many professing Christians get upset when you talk about Rome because they don't understand the theological distinctives. They don't understand the main doctrines of Rome that reject the gospel, that reject Christ, that reject, as I will point out, the incarnation, reject Christ alone is to be worshipped. They don't understand any of this, so they see Roman Catholics, and a lot of them would see Mormons and others, and one is Pentecostals, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I like to thank pastors who are cruise ship directors for making that possible. Pastors should be teachers. Teachers of the Word of God so their audience understands the differences between a non-Christian construct, between a group who denies justification or the doctrine of the Trinity, and Orthodox Christianity. Now as I mentioned many times, particularly when we're on these kind of subjects, because again, the solas were reactionary. There's two views of the Roman Catholic Church. One view is that the Roman Catholic Church is a true church with significant errors. The other view is that the Roman Catholic Church is a false church with significant truths. Right? And most, it seems, most apologists and others that are familiar with biblical theology would say Roman Catholic Church is a, is a false church with significant truths. However, I would reject that. I see them as a false church. But I see Rome as not holding any significant truths because you can't separate the person of Christ from his work. You can't. They deny the imputation of righteousness of Christ to the believer by faith alone. Justification by faith alone is the only recognized gospel in which they deny. You cannot say, I believe in the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, yet reject His work, the work of the Son. Amen. I see them as a false church with no significant truth, and for us, they're the objects of evangelism. Rome's auto-soteric system of salvation as Austin mentioned, 
is a system of ands, or as Robert Raymond says, a system of ets, which is the Latin term for ands. With Rome, it's God's universal plan and man's free will. Faith and works, Jesus and Mary. The cross and the perpetual sacrifices in the Mass. Biblical doctrine and the Church. Scripture and tradition. It's a whole system of ands. In other words, the Christ of Rome, or of Rome does not save alone. It's a corporate salvation in which there's a lot of different things on the cross. Up on the cross of Christ in the Roman view would be the many meritorious works of man, would be water baptism, would be sacraments. It's all on, on the cross with Christ. It would be fides implicita, implicit faith in the church no matter what. It would be all the popish pronouncements. And worst off, up on the cross with Christ is his mother. His mother. It is not Christ alone. Now the concept and proclamation of Solus Christos, as the other for sole, was reactionary to the false Christology of Rome. And it was taught to the Christians to edify their faith. The concepts, just as the church should be doing today. It's edifying to hear that Christ <coughs> saves, saves alone, through grace alone, Amen. because of faith alone, to the glory of God alone. And we know these things because of Scripture alone. It's quite edifying for the Christian. And we need to, frankly, we need to hear these doctrines all the time. Amen. We can't get tired of hearing about the deity of Christ. We can't get tired of John 1.1. 1, 1. We can't get tired of Romans 5.1 or the beautiful doctrines of justification. We should never get tired and we should always repeat those doctrines. Solus Christos, or Christ alone, through Christ alone, simply affirms the biblical teaching that salvation is through Christ alone. And it's the very, his cross work is the very ground. His alone cross work is the very ground of our justification. The very ground. It's not our faith act. It's the work of Christ alone. This is what Solus Christa, Christos teaches. And it teaches that his cross work was finished and he sat down at the right hand of God. Simply, Solus Christos affirms against Rome that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. Jesus Christ and the Christ of Biblical Revelation. Solus Christos affirms that there is one God and haste, one mediator between God and men, and that's Christ Jesus. But dealing with Solus Christos, what it doesn't mean is that salvation in all of its aspects is only in Christ alone. While the Father and the Holy Spirit are just on the sidelines. It doesn't teach that. Because we see that a salvation is accomplished by the monergistic work of the triune God. The Father, He elects. The Father justifies. Romans 8.33, the Father justifies. The Father declares righteous granting sinners the gift of faith, and it's the Father who imputes the righteousness of Christ. God the Son became flesh forevermore. He's forevermore the Theos Christos, the God Christ, forevermore. The Father didn't become flesh. The Holy Spirit wasn't incarnate, but God the Son became flesh. And He alone is both the priest and the atoning sacrifice. And God the Holy Spirit regenerates sinners. And that's the good news of the gospel, that God, the triune God, saves completely through the cross work of Christ alone. Now as mentioned, Saul's Christos was not invented by the reformers, but rather it was already proclaimed in the scriptures. Acts 
we read, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The prophets bear witness. The Old Testament prophets looked forward to that. Solus Christos was imprinted in the minds of the Old Testament prophets. I like what J.D. Kelly said, one of the greatest patristic scholars dealing with the plurality of God, in God in three persons. He says the multi-personal God, or the plurality of persons, was imprinted, imprinted in the minds of the apostolic church because it was imprinted because of Scripture. It was imprinted in the minds of the Old Testament prophets. And Christ alone, we can say the same thing. One thing I want to mention is that Solus Christos excludes the Roman priestcraft. It excludes it. Because in the, Old, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, there was only two priesthoods recognized. Levitical, Aaronic priesthood, and what? The Melchizedek priesthood. Rome can claim neither one. Melchizedek priesthood, that's, that has no, it's untransferable. It's Abarabaton, says the author of Hebrews in 724. There's no successors of the Melchizedek priesthood. Melchizedek and Christ, and that's it. So, if you're a Mormon missionary, that's bad news. Because no one else can have it. The Aaronic priesthood, the Old Testament priesthood, was obsolete according to the author of Hebrews. Imperfect, unfinished, because they died. It excludes the Roman priestcraft. In 1 John 2.21, if anyone should sin, we have, ekumen, we have, a, this is a presentation of certainty, we have now an advocate Proston Patera, with the Father. Amen. We have an advocate right now. Amen. Jesus Christ, the righteous. But we have, I love it, the same verb is used in Romans 5.1. Therefore, therefore, having been justified, it's passive, it's done to us, it's beautiful. Having been justified from faith, Ekumen, we have, not we will have, we may have, no, we have what? Peace. Aston theon, with the God. Not a peace that is a temporary peace when two nations go to war and then they, they cease fire. But they can always go back to war again. The peace that we have in reconciliation is permanent. We have peace with God. Now, dealing with Romans, I want to present the Solus Christos concept and teaching of Romans and Hebrews. Now, there's many, many, many passages that teach Solus Christos that Christ alone saves. Justification is by the Christ the cross work of Christ alone. It was the imputation of righteousness of Christ alone that's imputed to the believer. But I want to look at Romans and Hebrews. First of all, the book of Romans, as, as I see it, Paul's main thesis in the book of Romans was simply this. God's method of justification does not change. His method of justification does not change. When he, actually citing David, a man under the law, when he quotes John, or in, in Romans 4, 6, citing David, God credits, God credits or imputes, legisatai, imputes, Righteousness, choris ergon, apart from works. That's the method. Apart from works. 
He gives Abraham as his example at first. Abraham was not under the law, but he was justified through faith alone. He was credited as righteous through faith alone. And then he gives David in Romans 4. And that's what we'll look at. Through the righteousness of Christ alone. In verse 1 of chapter 4. Or chapter 5, I'm sorry. We're going to go to chapter 5. As I read, therefore, having been justified, Dikaiothentis, one word, it's an Aries passive participle, meaning the passive, it was done to us, having been, notice the past element, having been justified, how? From the instrument of faith, not the cause of faith, then you can say that faith was your, the faith act was your work. Paul says, having been justified from, act from faith, we have peace with God. Verse 6. Now again, his thesis is, in Romans, you might say, overall, God's method of justification has not changed. He gives Abraham as an example. He gives David as an example, especially in Romans 4, 4 through 8. And he gives himself in the Christian church his presentation. <laughs> In verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In verse 9. Much more, same verb as Romans 5.1, have you been justified by His blood? Not by your anything. By His blood. We shall be saved, apotes orges, from the wrath of God. We're saved from the orge, from the wrath of God. We're justified through his cross work, through his blood, alone, through him, Solus Christos. In verse 10, while we were ekthroi, enemies, hostility, and I take the word as being in a passive sense, like Paul uses it in, in uh, Romans 11, 28, meaning that you were the object of holy hatred. You were the object of hostility before you were saved. While you were enemies, while he saw you as an enemy, and of course you saw him as an enemy, but directly, while you were in the object of his holy exploit, hatred, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, we shall be saved by his life. We're saved by his death, but we're saved by his life. Amen. He lived the perfect life on our behalf. He was the substitutionary life on our behalf in a very vicarious way, fulfilling that which Adam completely broke. He fulfilled it on our behalf. We're saved by his death and his perfect life. Saved by the death, saved by his life, solus Christos. But interesting, note the progression in verses 6, 8, and 10. I think it's very exciting for us as Christians to see the concept of solus Christos be made alive. Just come out at you in these pages. The progress, the progress in verse 6, 8, and 10. Why we were still helpless, Christ died for us. Verse 8, why we were sinners. So why we were helpless, why we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why we were enemies. Helpless, sinners, enemies. That's how we were. 
Scripture defines us, the unsaved person, as dead. And a lot of times, many Christian, professing Christians, when they evangelize, they see the object of evangelism as not really dead, but a degree of righteousness in them, in which, you know, if they're articulate enough, if they're powerful enough in their preaching, that can spark that righteousness inside them because they just don't see the unsaved man as completely dead. But of course, we see Scripture as presenting us in a state of holy hatred. Not terminally ill, not sick, but dead. While you were dead, you were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. While you were an enemy, you were reconciled to God through the death of His Son alone. And much more, much more will be saved by His life. Our righteousness that God the Father has imputed us, it's not inside us. It's not inside us. If it was inside us, every time you sin, it would just, you would leak. This is in contrast to Rome's clinical, as I call it, a clinical system of justification or a clinical righteousness where the righteousness they teach is infused or injected like a serum. That's the whole idea between their system of confession so on and so forth. Because the righteousness is inside the person and it can leak every time you sin. If you commit mortal sins, you have to, what? Go to confession to receive your charted out works. And if you die without completing the prescribed amount of works, what happens? You have to justify yourself in a place called purgatory. What does that say about the work of Christ alone? It doesn't. It says it's not sufficient. They don't have a sufficient Savior that can save to the utmost. Now we still in Romans 5. I want you to know verses 15 through 21. Where we find a series of the adjective hanos, which is from the masculine haste, meaning one. We have a series of it. In Paul's presentation of Solus Christos, he uses this adjective to emphasize his point. It's beautiful. Remember, haste, the masculine term for one, the adjective for one, it's used in 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one God. Same word. And there's one mediator between God and men. And that's Christ alone. Paul uses this term again in the genitive. We, we have a whole series in Paul's presentation of Solus Christos. He emphasizes the one, a system of ones, the work of Christ in our justification from start to finish. Look at verse 15. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite each verse where Paul uses this concept, this, this adjective, to show you Christ alone. Verse 15. How much more did the grace of God and the gift of grace of the Hanas, Anthropu, the one, Man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The one, the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Verse 17. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life, tiatu hanas, through the one, through the one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18. So then, as though one transgression that result condemnation to, to all men, to this extent, he says literally, in this manner, hutos, to this manner, though hanas, the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life 
to the all men. Now, the all men is the same group in Romans 5.1. The all men who are justified. And verse 19. Through the obedience of the Hanas, the one, the many will be made righteous. There is one meter between God and men, and that's the one, Christ Jesus, Solus Christos. As Paul makes a beautiful presentation in Romans 5, so nobody will misunderstand it. I'd like to appeal to the author of Hebrews. And he uses a word to emphasize the once for all sacrifice of Christ alone. He uses the term in a series, just like Paul does in Romans 5, Hephaphats. Similar to Paul's usage of haste, the author of Hebrews uses this term, hafapax, meaning once for all. Once for all. To express that the atoning sacrifice of the eternal sinless priest was one for all time. In contrast to the Old Testament priests, whose work was never, ever finished because they kept dying. It was never finished. As with the Roman priestcraft, the Old Testament system of priesthood was incomplete and obsolete. According to the author of Hebrews, if you believe in the errancy and infallibility of Scripture, you'll believe it. Hebrews 7, 23 through 28. <clears throat> Writing as he was moved along by God the Holy Spirit, he says, the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because He, Christ, continues forever, He holds His priesthood apparabaton, without successors. And then in verse 25, Therefore He is able to save to the, to the utmost those who draw near to Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. For it is fitting to have a high priest, such a high priest, verse 27, chapter 7, who does not daily, or does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the, of the people, because this Christ did a fat pass once for all when he offered himself. Once for all when he offered himself. And in chapter 9, verse 12, it says Christ, it says He entered the holy place, Hathapax, once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And then in Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 14, by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, Hathapax. His offering was a fat pack once for all. In verse 11, every priest stands dead daily offering the same sacrifice over and over and over and over. They can never take away sins. But this priest sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down because his work was finished. The priest could never sit down. But because of the hafapax, the once for all sacrifice, he sat down and made perfect those being sanctified. In verse 12, having offered one, meon, one, same accusative pace, the one, sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies made a footstool for his feet. And in verse 14, by one, Mi'ah, the date of the pace, Mi'ah, one, offering he has perfected for all time, those being sanctified. The half acts, the one for all time, the once for all time sacrifice, is the very ground of our once for all time justification, opposing Rome's perpetual 
perpetual sacrifices at the Mass, which they teach was propitiatory. They keep re-sacrificing Christ. Completely in opposition to the Afapax that the author taught of Hebrews and completely in opposition to the haste doctrine of Paul by the one act of righteousness. Solus Christos, Christ alone, is the one through whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. The Hathapax, the once for all offering, was himself. And in conclusion, Solus Christos opposes Rome, their deficient Christ view, they really can't save, he's not able to save to the utmost. It opposes Rome's ex cathedral proclamation that the cross work was not sufficient in and of itself. And in contrast with biblical teaching is Solus Christos, Christ alone, who is our one mediator between God and man. As we read in 1 Corinthians 1.30 and verse 31. By his doing, by his doing, we are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God. And note, Paul says he became to us righteousness. He became to us righteousness. In Roman Catholicism, he does not become the righteousness of anybody. But Paul says he does. He became righteousness on our behalf. He became our sanctification. He became our redemption. <coughs> Therefore, whoever boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Because he is our propitiation for our sins. Him alone. Why we were still helpless, Christ died for us. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son alone. Solus Christos. Let us close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you enable us to confess that your Son is the Son of God, Theos Christos, the God Christ, who became flesh in our behalf, who died on the cross, whose work is the very ground of our justification. And we thank you, Lord God, that you gave us to this Son of the biblical revelation. And Jesus promised us the ones that you gave to him. Whoever is in my hand will never, never et below, cast, be cast out. By this we have been sanctified, says the author of Hebrews, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, a fat house, once and for all, solus Christos. Amen. Amen.